Welcome to the 207th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with Robert Wilson, author of the thriller novel, You Will Never Find Me. This episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast is sponsored by Cracking the Website Code. You can find that at crackingthewebsitecode.com. Again, stay tuned for my interview with Robert Wilson. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Robert Wilson, author of the new thriller novel, You Will Never Find Me, which is the second book in the Charles Boxer series that began with the novel Capital Punishment. Wilson is a previous winner of the CWA Gold Dagger Award for his novel A Small Death in Lisbon, and his novel The Vanished Hands won the Gumshoe Award for Best European Crime Novel. Robert, welcome to the podcast. Great, great, great to be here. Thank you. Great. Well, can you read a couple of pages from your new novel, You Will Never Find Me? Sure, I'll be glad to. 3.30 p.m., Saturday the 17th, March 2012, Mercy Dankwa's House, Streatham, London. Goodbye, room. Shitty little prison. The only thing missing are the bars on the windows. Been locked in here a few times over the years. She looked around the four bare walls for the last time. It had been quite an operation to gradually move out all her stuff and dump it. Every day after school, instead of going straight back to her grandmother Esme in Hampstead, she'd spent an hour erasing herself from her mother's Streatham home. As she checked the room, she pushed back the half-open wardrobe door to look at herself in the full-length mirror inside. Black quilted coat zipped up, red skirt, black wool tights, black biker boots. She sheathed the great swag of her dark ringlets with blonde highlights in both hands to see how she would look with it all cut off. Her light green eyes stood out from the caramel smoothness of her wide face. Feline. She didn't mind that. She let her hands fall and the hair sprang back over her shoulders. She shrugged, kicked the cupboard door closed. She unzipped her coat, took a letter out addressed to Mercy and Charles, which she tossed onto the bed. She hoisted the rucksack over her shoulder and picked up the last two packed bin liners, went downstairs, put them by the front door. She looked in on her mother, Detective Inspector Mercy Dankwa, as she liked to call her because she knew it both annoyed Mercy and hurt her. I'm off out for a bit, she said. I'll see you at the restaurant later. What's it called? Patog said Mercy, looking up from the Guardian magazine. It's in Crawford Place. You've been there with us before. Best thing to do is walk up the Edgware Road from Marble Arch. Oh, yeah, through Little Beirut, she said, closing the door. See ya! She picked up the bin liners and walked out of her old life, flicking the front door behind her with her foot so that it slammed shut, rattling the, fl- the letterbox flap. She caught a bus down to Streatham High Road, left the bin bags at the clothing bank and walked onto the police station which was empty. The football was still on and the great British public evenings drinking hadn't got started. She went up to the overweight desk sergeant with his grey hair and tired eyes, a family man who wasn't with his family but wanted to be. What can I do you for, he asked, smiling, hands clasped on the, on the counter. My name's Amy Boxer and I'm leaving home, she said, not even giving that old joke so much as a nod. I see, said the sergeant. And how old? Eighteen in November, she said, and slapped her driving licence on the counter. Got anywhere to go, he said, taking her seriously now, checking the photo and the dates. I won't be out on the street, if that's what you mean, she said. I've got money, a bank card, a place to go. You're quick off the blocks, he said, pushing the licence back to her. Trouble at home? You could say that, she said, as if this was a massive understatement. She regretted it, hadn't wanted to pique his interest, and now she could see all manner of family uglinesses coming alive in his mind. I just need to get away from my mother, that's all, she said. We're not getting on. Embarrassing, ridiculous and annoying, asked the sergeant. That's not a bad summary of one of her good days, but a little more emphasis on the annoying. And Dad, he asked hopefully. He's not there. They separated a long time ago. 
Why not go and stay with him? This was not how it was supposed to play out. He was embroiling her. She could see his daddiness coming out. Cup of tea, take a seat. Next thing he'd be walking her back home. Job done. Can I trust you, she asked, and knew she'd hooked him. Of course you can, he said. That's what I'm here for. My mum's going to call when she finds out I've gone, she said, and then when she does, I want you to open this letter and read it, but not before, right? Her name is Mercy Dankwa. You'll recognise her. What do you mean, I'll recognise her? She didn't answer, but pushed the letter across the counter and left the station. She caught a bus to Brixton, removed the SIM card from her mobile, which she bent and chucked. She dumped the phone in the gutter and took the tube to Green Park and then on to Heathrow. By 4.45, she was going up in the lift to the Terminal 1 check-in. She came out onto the concourse, checked that flight BA522 to Madrid was not delayed and went straight to the ladies' toilet in Zone B. The taxi dropped Mercy off at home in Streatham at 10.30pm. She was a little drunk. She and Charlie had been celebrating the successful conclusion to a kidnap case and had polished off both bottles of red they'd brought with them to the unlicensed Iranian grill. It was as she was hanging a coat up that she detected a certain quality to the silence in the house. For once the ambient vibe was neutral, rather than pulsing with hostile reflux emanating from the lethal brew of teenage hormones stewing inside her daughter. She dropped her bag with renewed hopelessness, shook her head. This kid, probably still out with her friends, having stood them up in the restaurant and failed to respond to any of, of their calls or texts. She stomped upstairs in a fury, and without knocking, hurled open the bedroom door, slashed on the lights, and found the room much emptier than usual. Echoingly empty. Mercy frowned, nothing on the walls, carpet hoovered. And what's this? The white envelope on the bare bed. The two names. She picked it up, and even through her drunkenness, felt the little crushes to her heart as she remembered when she'd last been called Mum. Four years ago. She tore open the seal, pinched the bridge of her nose, and read the precise rounded letters of her daughter's handwriting. Dear Mercy and Charles, I've had enough of this kind of life. It bores me being a child, your child. I've had it with all the expectations. School makes me sick. Literally, I vomit on arrival every morning. What's the point of it? Do the work, pass the exams, go to uni, copy shit from the internet for three years, get a half assed degree in window dressing, come out 60 grand down, fall into the abyss of unemployment. Fuck all that. I've made my decision. I want to live my life on my own terms, which means, because you're the way you are, I'm leaving home. I will not be in any danger, or at least no more than anybody else is. I will not be on the streets. I'm organised. I have money. I'm telling you all this because I don't want you to come looking for me. I don't need to be found. I want to be left alone. Something you've been pretty good at most of my childhood, but not good enough. So don't go putting on your cop hats and wasting your time digging away because you'll be doing the wrong thing by me. And what's more, you will never find me. Okay, great. Well, if someone listening hasn't heard about You Will Never Find Me yet, how would you describe your new novel? Well, it's a thriller. It's, um, as you probably gathered, this is a, a girl who's just left home. She's uh, uh, a difficult teenager. She's uh, you know, had a difficult past. She's, she's already had a few incidents where she's, she's run away from home. And uh, she disappears off to, to Madrid. Um, fortunately, her parents are, because they're professionals, both professionals, one's a kidnap consultant, the other's a, a police officer in the kidnap unit, and they have tremendous sort of contacts, and they quite quickly find that she's, um, through, through the, the border control peoples, they've found that she's left and gone to Madrid. So Charles Boxer goes off and tries to find her. And also because he's very good at what he does, he quite quickly finds out that she's been introduced to, or she's, she's met a very ugly uh, Colombian drug trafficker who calls himself El Osito. Um, and 
he decides that uh, he was, he's going to track this guy, Elosito, down, which he very successfully does. Um, and suddenly a body part appears. And uh, this body part um, has comes comes along with uh, with his daughter's uh, passport, and he realizes um, the the very very real possibility that uh, something terrible has happened, and um, so he mounts his revenge on Elosito, who, who he sees to be the, the 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 main suspect, and this is where everything goes terribly wrong. Um, so yeah, I would say that this is a pursuit caper, if you like, mm-hmm. um, with uh, Charles Boxer looking for his daughter, and then finding where, where she's gone, and then and then also having the tables through through a, a really very extraordinary twist, having the tables turned on him. So instead of being the hunter, he becomes the hunted. Um, and meanwhile, back in London, we've got another story strand, which is that Mercy, who realizes that she's not going to be very helpful to to Boxer, she doesn't speak Spanish, and really to operate in Spain, you've got to be able to speak Spanish. And so she doesn't go there with him uh, to to find her daughter. She stays back at in London and decides to take on this job, which is uh, looking for this young Russian boy who's been seems to have been kidnapped. And quickly finds out that his father has been helping uh, or or has been looking to find out uh, where this Russian, his Russian friend, who is an old Secret Service buddy, uh, has been poisoned um, in London. And he's trying to find where this poison has come from and hopefully finger the, the, the Russian state. And she quite quickly finds out how wonderful this boy is, this young boy, Sasha Bobkov. And she decides that it's going to be her mission to to rescue this boy. This is the way in which she hopes she will she will balance the terrible thing that is that has happened to her daughter. So yes, yeah, there's the there it's, it's a, a two stranded um, book. Um, and I think, yeah. Great. Well, do you remember the initial idea for the characters, Charles Boxer and his wife, Mercy Dankwa? Well, I suppose that I, what, what it was, it came about in a rather strange way, the, the, the these characters, because, uh, well, first of all, I, I I decided that I wanted to write about private security companies, and a lot of private security companies are based in London. This is the sort of the base of of the private security in- industry. The only problem being is that most private security companies, um, their operations are not in London; they are uh, outside. I mean, places like Iraq and Afghanistan, those sort of places. And I particularly wanted to set my story in London. Uh, I've been a Londoner for um, maybe a good 10 years of my life where I actually lived there. Mm -hmm. Then I'd uh, always been going back to London over the 20 years that I had been a a writer. And then very recently I'd started, you know, I'd bought a flat in London and I started started living there again. Um, So that was my main motivation was to, was to, to write a book about London. Um, and then uh, I, I looked at private security companies, realized that the only possible um, part of a, a private security company business that would work with a London setting was was a kidnap. And then I also realized talking to um, a, a guy who used to be a, the director of operations of a private security company specializing in, in, in kidnap, I quite r- quickly realized that one of the big problems was that you cannot operate as a freelance kidnap consultant in London. You have to inform the Metropolitan Police, and they have their own kidnap unit. 
So then I decided, right, I've got a, <laughs> I've got a kidnap consultant, um, and I've got to have somebody who's part of a kidnap unit in the Metropolitan Police. So there, I thought, well, oh, I've got my two, my two characters there. Um, and then it was uh, a decision about how I'm going to develop them as characters. Was well, that was much more, much more complicated uh, scenario. I mean, I, I've done quite a few characters who are what I would call morally ambivalent. Um, but my intention with, with Charles Boxer was to really test the reader um, when it comes to... I, I, I actually think these days, you know, we, we don't have to make many moral choices, you know, unlike my parents, for instance, you know, who were in the Second World War mm -hmm. and who were constantly confronted with moral choices and, 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 and life and death choices. We don't actually find ourselves having to make those sort of decisions. Um, and so what I, I thought was interesting was, do we actually have a kind of a, a morality muscle and does that sort of morality muscle atrophy, atrophy, atrophy if, uh, if we don't use it. And so I thought I was going to develop this character who was morally ambiguous. And you would read him and you would have to decide whether you were with him or against him. Um, the thing about Charles Boxer is that he's not just a kidnap consultant. Uh, people hire him for a very specific reason and that is because he he offers uh, an extra after sales service and that is that uh, he will track down people who have uh, uh, been responsible for a kidnap and and take them out um, now there are some people who find that very difficult to deal with um, they 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 can see that he's he, he's he really wants to be where it matters. He he really wants to save the the, the, the these hostages from their their dire circumstances. But are they morally um, questionable enough to accept? that this heroic type person is prepared to go off and kill people, even if those people are bad people? Are they prepared to accept him as, as juror and, and judge and executioner? Uh, so that was my, those were my, my reasons for developing uh, Charles Boxer. Mercy Dankwa, again, was... Um, came about over a series of, you know, musings, I suppose. You know, I, I decided that the, the thing about Charles Boxer, one of the reasons why Charles Boxer is such a curious character is that he's lost his, lost his father. His father was uh, wanted for questioning um, in the murder of his wife's business partner, i.e. Boxer's mother. Boxer's mother's business partner uh, was was found uh, murdered, and all they wanted to do was question uh, Boxer's father, and he disappeared before they got to him, and he's never been heard of since. Uh, and Boxer was seven years old at the time, and this was a very difficult thing for for Charles Boxer to 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 deal with. I mean, he had a very powerful relationship with his father; he loved him very intensely and felt that his father loved him very strongly back as well. So uh, in later life, he decides he's going to go off and find him. And he makes various attempts. When he's 14, he cycles down to Spain. And then when he's 18, he runs away from school and, and gets across uh, the Sahara Desert and, um, and finds himself in Ghana. He, he's been told that this is where people come to lose themselves. And so he goes to West Africa, ends up in Ghana, and he's pointed to this police 
officer's door, uh, this police officer's uh, home in Kumasi, you might be able to help him you know, find you know, Europeans who are working uh, in that area. Goes up there and he doesn't find his father, but he finds Mercy. And Mercy is having a terrible time being the daughter of this police officer who is a very difficult man. Um, between them, they plan their escape and they run away together. And he brings her back to to London. And uh, she then goes into the police force and after various sort of twists and turns, ends up ends up in the kidnap unit. They they split up, but then they come back together again long enough to get for, for Mercy to get pregnant. Then they split up again, but Mercy has Amy, and this is they're still friends. Um, Charles and Mercy, uh, they have this daughter together, and. Um, and Charles Boxer has decided that he's giving up uh, being a permanent member of staff with the biggest um, private security company in London to go freelance in order that he can spend a bit more time with uh, with his daughter. And he's immediately thrown into this particular scenario with uh, Amy running off into the night. So yeah, that's the, that's the the genesis of the, those two characters. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, well. Um, you've written 12 novels. What, what led you to writing your first novel? Had you always wanted to be a writer before then? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I suppose it all goes back to when I was a, a kid at school and, uh, we were asked to write a poem, uh, which we had to write in the first half of the lesson and then read it out in the second half of the lesson. So I went off and wrote this poem, which, which was a love poem. And, uh, I wasn't known as a poet at 14 years old. I was known as a very good rugby player. And when the teacher asked at the beginning of the next part of the lesson, who wants to read their poem out first, nobody wanted to do it. And so I said, look, well, I'll, I'll read my poem out, you know. And there was a lot of jeering because uh, I was known as a jock and, and not as a, a poet. And I said, look, I'm making no claims as a poet. I'm just prepared to read my poem out first. So that's what happened. I read this poem out and the jeering stopped with the first line, which I can't remember what it is, but <laughs> they listened to that poem very, very carefully. There wasn't, there were, there was, there was no, it was, it was the silence that got to me. They listened so carefully that you could really hear a pin drop and the silence lasted for about a minute afterwards. Until the teacher just looked at me and said, wow, where did that come from? You know, <laughs> and I suppose, you know, when you have an experience like that, when you're 14, you suddenly think, well, maybe, maybe I can do this. You know, It took another 20 years before I got a no novel published, you know, and then it wasn't poetry. It was a crime novel. <laughs> so, <laughs> So were there were there rejections along the way in terms of your path to publication for that first novel? Well, I, I traveled a lot. You see, I always traveled. When I when I was at university, I went to the States. I did a Greyhound bus tour around the States. And then I went, uh, I drove, when you could just still do it, I drove um, from London to, to, to Nepal through Iran and Afghanistan. Um, and when I left university, I worked in, in Greece for a year. Um, I'd, I'd always travel. I'd, I'd, when I got married to my, my wife, the first thing we did was go and travel around Africa for a year. We went through the desert and, you know, crossed over in, through Zaire and into East, East Africa. So I was a well-traveled person. And I always assumed that I would write travel stories. And I'd, and I'd started writing travel stories when, in fact, the, the, the market for travel books just completely fell apart you know, at the end of the 80s, early 90s. And uh, I'd show, I showed these stories that I was writing to a friend of mine who was a, an Australian screenwriter. And I said, what do you think of these? And he said, well, you're not going to sell these as travel stories, but if you develop these into a crime novel, now that could be interesting because, you know, you can write and these have got a tremendous uh, atmosphere. 
I mean, all you've got to do is is come up with a convincing character and some some good crimes, and and you're off. Uh, and I said, well, look, the thing is, I haven't really read any crime novels for a long time. I mean, I, I used to read them when I was a kid, you know, when I was 12, 13, 14. And then, you know, then I went to university and I was reading English and I kind of, you know, I didn't read them anymore, you know. And he said, well, OK, why don't you try, you know, the classic, try Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett. And then when you've read those guys, try Elmore Leonard. And so that's what I did. And I read uh, those guys, and I thought, "Wow, yeah, I can do this. <laughs> this, this is great." <laughs> so uh, that's how I that's why I got into it. Gotcha. So but what... I didn't I didn't actually have many many I didn't have any rejections. I I, I wrote my first novel. It took me a while to 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 get to it. To I mean, I probably had three or four goes at uh, trying to write a novel. But once I once I got that uh, that African atmosphere and got into my character, uh, I wrote that book, sent it off. I found an agent, and within six months, I had a I had a publisher. That's great. Well, well, what advice would you have for aspiring writers who may be listening, who would one day like to sell their own novels or short stories? Well, I think you know. You might be lucky. You might be lucky and be an extraordinarily brilliant and original writer. Um, but more probably than not, you, you, you won't be. And what I would suggest is that you find people that you really admire and try and find your voice through them. I mean, you've got to be careful. You, you don't want to end up writing pastiche. But you find a, a voice that you like. I mean, what, what, what uh, Raymond Chandler, Dashiell Hammett, Elmore Leonard brought home to me was, was noir. I really loved that noir voice. And so I decided that that's what I was going to write. I was going to develop my, my novels into, my, my African novels into, into noir books. And uh, I probably started using quite a lot of, you know, Chandler-esque, uh, similes, for instance, you know, but then gradually, I found my voice through through working. I mean, you know, Raymond Chandler never wrote in Africa, so I was always going to be writing with a, uh, about, about a different background. Mm -hmm. But he certainly helped me just focus. That's really what it what it helped. Great. Well, uh, do you still read a lot today? And uh, uh, if you do, I wonder what what books have you read recently that that you would recommend. Well, a book I'm reading at the moment um, is a very interesting book uh, called The Root of All Evil. And it's by an Italian guy called Roberto Constantini. And the reason I like it is because it gives me, it's giving me an insight into something I don't know about. And that is uh, Italian businessmen working in Libya in the sort of pre-Gaddafi years. Um, and he develops he develops into a into a crime novel set in 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 Rome in in, in the 90, early nineteen eighties. But uh, this initial bit set in in Libya, I'm 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 really loving it. I think it's great. That's great. And I should add, I interviewed the the author as well. <laughs> oh, did he? I did. He's very. Did. He's a good guy, isn't he? Yeah, I, he is. He is. <laughs> he was on my panel recently at. Uh, Crime Fest in Bristol. Yeah. And he's a very interesting, sophisticated, very nice guy. He is. He is. So so what are you what are you working on now? Are you writing another Charles Boxer novel? Yeah, I'm on the I'm on the fourth Charles Boxer book at the moment. Um so you are on the second one in the United States, and the third one, which is called Stealing People, will be coming out next year. Um, and I'm writing the fourth one, which will come out the year after. I haven't got a title for the fourth one yet. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Robert Wilson, author of 12 highly acclaimed thriller and crime novels. Wilson's latest novel, You Will Never Find Me, is in bookstores now, so go grab a copy today. And Robert, thanks for doing this interview. It's a pleasure. Great. Thanks, you. Great. Great. 
Hello, Discover here to explain our cash back match. Here's how it works. We give you cash back for using your Discover card on the things you were going to buy anyway. Then we match that cash back in your first year. And that's why we call it cash back match. Now to recap and say cash back one more time. We match all the cash back you've earned at the end of your first year automatically. Discover, exceptionally common sense. Learn more at discover.com slash match. Limitations apply. You know when you order a new video game or a golf club or a blender and then it arrives at your door, you get a little thrill. Imagine how much more thrilling it is when you order a new car. With Nissan at home, you can shop for the perfect ride and order it without ever having to go anywhere. Sure beats a golf club or a blender. Buy a new car entirely online with Nissan at home. Deliver direct from dealer to driveway. Thrill starts here. Services may vary at participating dealers subject to applicable lossy dealer for details.